Today, we need to answer a question that will help us to understand why God judges his people. Why the woe? We're looking at Isaiah 29, and you can take a look at the chart on the back of your notes there. But Isaiah 29 is set in the judgment section of the book of Isaiah. Chapters 28 through 35 contain five woes to the people of Israel and to Judah. And it's super important to read the word as woe. Not ah, but woe, because that's a stronger word. And it really means a direct warning of sure consequences. So chapter 29, God focuses specifically on his people in Jerusalem, which he calls Ariel. And it's set in the 700s B.C. during the reign of the good king Hezekiah. And that's significant because God is going to do something unique for them in 701 B.C. So why the woe? Well, let me explain it this way. I wish you could have known my dad. I really do. He was generous. He was kind. He was quiet, and in his quiet way, he was also funny, and he was faithful. He loved Jesus, and he loved each one of us in his family, and we all knew it for sure. Well, one Thanksgiving, Kirsten and I loaded up our minivan, and we drove our kids to Ohio to celebrate with my family. And one of those nights while we were home, our whole family was together, including my cousin Lad, who was six months older than me, which completely bugged me when we were 16. But we grew up together, and by this time, we were both dads and in our 30s, and we were itching for some adventure. And my mom had just gotten a Jeep Cherokee, and so I suggested that we boys take it for a little spin. But before we left, my dad very emphatically and with a slight bit of irritation in his voice, he said, Kenny, remember, Jeeps can't go anywhere. Well, this was a woe from my dad that I'd heard before. Why? Because he was warning me of sure consequences and because he loved me. Yep, thanks, Dad. See you later. And so off we went. And I brought my two oldest boys, who I think were six at the time, and we headed down the road to go off the road. And we found a perfect spot. There was a housing development about a mile and a half or so away from my parents' home, and they had just cleared all the trees from the housing plots. Oh, and it was dark, and it had been raining all week. Now, I'm not stupid, so I engaged it in four-wheel drive, and before I committed full force, I put the front tires into the mud while I left the back tires on the pavement just to be sure that it wasn't going to sink. And it didn't. It was like, this is great. So we buckled up, gunned it, and we're ready for a great little joyride, and you can guess what happened. The Jeep handled perfectly for about 100 feet until the terrain started to slope away from the road and down. Oops. I'm sure glad Kenny and Danny were wearing their boots. This story of my experience of my dad loving me through his warning parallels the love that God has for his people as he warns them and us. And in Isaiah 29, that's exactly what he's doing. If you would please turn there if you haven't already, we're going to look at the whole chapter together today. Here God gives this woe to his people because he wants to call them back to a right relationship with him. Their hearts were hard. Their religion was external. And their trust was in other world powers and their gods. So God initiated judgment here on his people so that their hearts would return to him. Love is God's motivation here. Isaiah 29, the whole chapter reflects this principle that God judges because he loves. And that's seen in chapters 1 through 39 really clearly. And that concept, that principle of God judging because he loves is throughout the word of God. In fact, Paul reflects this principle really well in 2 Corinthians 7.10 where he says this, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. What a great passage. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. So why the woe? Well, the woe is discipline from God 
because he loves his people. We're going to look at verses 1 through 16 to start. And as we read that passage, I'll do the reading. You can follow along. And I encourage you to look at God's initiation, how God's at the front of this, as well as the metaphors God uses. So let's read together. Woe to you, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David settled. Add year to year and let your cycle of festivals go on. Yet I will besiege Ariel. She will mourn and lament. She will be to me like an altar hearth. I will encamp against you all around. I will encircle you with towers and set up my siege works against you. Brought low, you will speak from the ground. Your speech will mumble out of the dust. Your voice will come ghost-like from the earth. Out of the dust, your speech will whisper. But your many enemies will become like fine dust, the ruthless hordes like blown chaff. Suddenly, in an instant, the Lord Almighty will come with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with windstorm and tempest and flames of devouring fire. Then the hordes of all the nations that fight against Ariel, that attack her and her fortress and besiege her, will be as it is with a dream, with a vision in the night, as when a hungry man dreams that he's eating, but he awakens and his hunger remains. As when a thirsty man dreams that he is drinking, but he awakens faint with his thirst unquenched. So will it be with the hordes of all the nations that fight against Mount Zion. Be stunned and amazed. Blind yourselves and be sightless. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not from beer. The Lord has brought over you a deep sleep. He has sealed your eyes, the prophets. He has covered your heads, the seers. For you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to somebody who can read and say to him, read this, please, he'll answer, I can't, it's sealed. Or if you give the scroll to somebody who cannot read and say, read this, please, he'll answer, I don't know how to read. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down, as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what be formed say to him who formed it, he did not make me? Can the pot say of the potter, he knows nothing? The woe is discipline from God because he loves his people. We look at the first section here in verses 1 to 4, and we see God besieging and humbling his people in Jerusalem. Ariel is the nickname for Jerusalem. That's clear. Verse 1, Ariel is called the city where David settled. That's Jerusalem. Verse 8, Ariel is called Mount Zion. That's Jerusalem. This is a nickname for Jerusalem, but it's also a play on words with the phrase altar hearth in verse 2. Altar hearth and Ariel are made up of the exact same letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And there's clearly a play because Isaiah wants the people in Jerusalem to understand that they will undergo fighting, bloodshed, flames of devouring fire, which are all the consequences of sin, and they will undergo this as if they are a virtual giant altar hearth, the place where sacrifices are offered. And please notice throughout this whole section that it's God who initiates this besieging and this humbling of his people, even though he uses the nation of Assyria. So verses 5 to 8, we see that God promises to devastate the Assyrians. Look at verses 5 and 6. Your many enemies will become like fine dust, the ruthless hordes like blown chaff. Dust and chaff, blown away, worthless. The Lord Almighty will come with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with windstorm and tempest 
and flames of devouring fire. We see this picture of God's power and authority and his presence epitomized in Exodus 19 on Mount Sinai. And here again, we see God's power and authority epitomized in these things. Now, there seems to be a partial fulfillment here where this situation gets dealt with by God's power and authority in 701 B.C., when King Hezekiah in Jerusalem gets saved against the power and the threats of Sennacherib of Assyria. And it's against all odds. Like, Jerusalem no way could have fought the Assyrian army. And God did the fighting for them. And you can see this played out in Isaiah 36 and 37. We'll be getting to those chapters in the next few months. But also 2 Kings 19 shows that story as well, where God's victory was obvious. There, all credit went to the Lord because he devastated the Assyrians. That's the partial fulfillment. But there also seems to be a potential pointing forward to an ultimate fulfillment at the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon, after Jesus' second return, is, is alluded to in Zechariah 14. You can look that up and read some of those chapters. And Revelation chapter 20. And here we see God beginning to deal with the world and sinners in a way that is very conclusive. His power and authority are clear here. And the devastation of the Assyrians are described like a bad dream. Have you ever had a dream like this? Maybe you're starving, you're in a place, maybe you're traveling or whatever, and you're dreaming, and, and you're thinking about, you just want to go home, and you, you, you dream that you're home, and you, can't, you, can't, you feel your bed, and you feel like the, the window blowing in, and all the common feelings of being home, and you wake up, and you're still away. Mm, that was just a dream. Here, it's the hungry and the thirsty, and all they're thinking about is eating and drinking, because they are so hungry, famished, and so thirsty, parched. And they go to sleep, and they are assuming that it's all gone away because they're feasting and drinking, and then they wake up. The picture is of Assyria counting their chickens before they're hatched. Now, that's an idiom. And probably unless you are a, an egg farmer, you don't really understand the idiom. You've heard it, but you don't use it every day. So an egg farmer would never go in and look at their coop and say, oh, I've got 58 eggs here, great, I'm going to be able to sell 58 chicks. No, no, no. They know that foxes are real, they know that some won't hatch, they know that they have to wait until the hatching happens to be able to go, I have 32 chickens I can sell. The Assyrians were already planning on beating Israel. The Assyrians were assuming that they were going to dominate and they were going to win the battle. But the Lord had different plans. It was not to be. God promises to devastate the Assyrians, and he does. So verses 9 to 16, it's a little longer section, but here God begins to make, I would say, accurate accusations against his people. And his first accusation is about spiritual blindness, and his second accusation is about hard-heartedness. So looking at verses 9 to 12, we see this spiritual blindness that is brought on by the people themselves. And this lack of control and ability to, to, Ill, imist, in, to, to, to direct people in their lives is shown in this drunkenness and staggering. The Lord has brought over you a deep sleep. He has sealed your eyes, prophets. He has covered your heads. And the, the scroll where the word of God is contained and God's will and desire for his people is sealed. People have lost the power and authority to be able to open the word and preach it and understand it. And it's as if people are now illiterate. They can't even read it with understanding. Here it is, spiritual blindness that results in a loss of self-control, in a loss of authority, and in a loss of ability. But then the second section there looks at hard-heartedness as the accusation. These people come near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts, distant, disconnected, far from me. They worship just based on rules made up by men. They actually 
go to, to do their planning and they assume that they can hide it from the Lord and they, they act as if God doesn't even see. And then, with great pride, they actually act like as if they were a pot looking at the potter saying, I made myself. I'm the one that set myself up here. Hard-heartedness looks like external religious hoop jumping. It looks like hiding our true motives from the Lord as if he can't see us. And it leads to an arrogance, even against the Lord Almighty, that kind of shoves our fist in his face. Ray Ortland Jr. said it this way. These people, they were using the worship of God as a mechanism. A mechanism for avoiding God, a mechanism for controlling God, and a mechanism for setting limits on God. So here in this section, we see God disciplines his people because he loves them, but these people clearly deserved it. I mean, they had rejected God. Their pride was dominating them. They were hiding things and thinking they could get away with it. They were dominating other people. They deserved it. That was them. What about us? We have to go here. We have to apply God's word, even the prophecies, to our lives and realize that these resonate, these statements, these principles, these warnings, these woes, they resonate in my heart because I've done this too. I've done things in secret as if God doesn't see me. I've hurt other people. I have walked away. I have gone through the motions. I've gone to scads of worship services and just kind of gone, almost done. We are guilty. We are them. So here's what I want you to do for just a moment. I want you to relook at verses 9 to 13. You can reread it. You can pray through it or whatever. And I want you to ask God, how's my heart? How's my heart? Has your hard heart made you spiritually blind to God's reality in your life? Is self-control missing in your life? Or is there a blockage of understanding or even caring to do and obey God's word? Take a few moments. How's my heart? This woe in chapter 29 is definitely discipline from God because he loves his people, but it's also deliverance from God because he loves his people. And this is quite amazing. The the mercy of God, the patience of God, the the long-suffering of God, the loving kindness of God is portrayed in this next section, verses 17 to 24. The woe is deliverance from God because he loves his people. So let's read that together. In a very short time, will not Lebanon be turned into a fertile field, and the fertile field seem like a forest? In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord, the needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. The ruthless will vanish, the mockers will disappear, and all who have an eye for evil will be cut down. Those who with a word make a man out to be guilty, who ensnared the defender in court, and with false testimony deprive the innocent of justice. Therefore, this is what the Lord, who redeemed Abraham, says to the house of Jacob. No longer will Jacob be ashamed. No longer will their faces grow pale. When they see among them their children, the work of my hands, they will keep my name holy. They will acknowledge the holiness of of the Holy One of Jacob, and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Those who are wayward in spirit will gain understanding, and those who complain will accept instruction. The woe is deliverance from God because he loves his people. And there's a sense of transformation here. There's a sense of a hope. There's a sense of relief and release 
So we see in verses 17 and 18 that God sets out to replenish his people. God replenishes his people from devastation to harvest as pictured in Lebanon. Lebanon is north of Israel. And Lebanon was known for its great mountains, its fertile valleys, and of course, its lush, green, beautiful cedars of Lebanon. And so the picture is, we go from devastation and control of other nations to harvest, fruitfulness. God replenishes his people from deafness to hearing the word of God to having the blockage removed, to be able to hear and obviously understand what God's word is saying as if the seal has been broken. And God replenishes his people from blindness to seeing God's truth, being able to see what God is saying and apply it to my life. The blindness is removed. God's replenishment of his people. Verses 19 to 21, we see God restoring justice for his people. This is a great section. Rejoicing will happen for those that are, it says, humble or meek, and for those that are needy or poor in spirit. And so we see a a rejoicing that is an emotional response. And it's like this. It's not like academic, like, oh, I've got restoration going on, and there's going to be justice, and now I really know that this is great. No, this is an emotional thrill. It's like, okay, like some of you will be experiencing next week or so, and all of us can remember back, but that feeling you get on the last day of school when it's all done, you turn in your textbooks, and you throw away your notes, and you run out the school doors, and you are done, and it's all summer right in front of you. Even us old people, we can remember that, right? And some of you get to experience it really soon. That's the feeling. It's not just academic, oh, I know school's over and summer's ahead. That's great. No, no. It's like, oh, I can't wait. It's like shaking up a Coke can and opening it. It has to come out. That's the rejoicing that happens. That's the picture we have of when God begins to deliver then we feel that in that way. And justice will not be deprived anymore. The ruthless, they're going to go away, vanish. The mockers will disappear. All who have an eye for evil, they're going to be cut down by the Lord God. No longer can they accuse people who haven't done anything wrong as guilty. Justice will not be deprived. When? When will this happen? Is this now? seems to be a pointing forward to after Jesus' second coming to when the kingdom of God is on earth and Jesus reigns and rightness is happening. God restores justice for his people. The The last section, verses 22 through 24, we see God redeeming his people, buying them back. And God removes the shame and the guilt. He takes it away. He takes away that awful feeling in your stomach. He takes the weight off your back. He redeems and he removes the shame and the guilt. And as a result, it says the people will acknowledge God by the way they live. They'll keep my name holy. They will acknowledge the holiness of the Holy One of Jacob and they'll stand in awe of the God of Israel. They'll live in awe of God. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 uses that word acknowledge in a very key way. And that word acknowledge has a little word right in the middle. No. K-N-O-W. No. And it alludes to the fact that we have an opportunity to live in a relationship with God. Experiencing a relationship with God that's reciprocal and that's real. And we live as if God exists. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him. Live as if God exists, and then he'll direct your paths. It's a great promise to live in awe of him. But notice, this whole second part of the chapter seems to point ahead 
to when this all is fulfilled in Jesus Christ and trusting in what Jesus does as our only hope for deliverance. And yet part of it, we can taste it today. If we will humble ourselves, if we will respond to God with poverty of spirit, we can experience this replenishing, this restoration, and this redemption that God promises. So let's wrap it up. I wondered if you have ever felt God's discipline in your life. In fact, I, I guess that's not even a question. I know you have, as I have. You've been confronted in your sin. Maybe you've felt shame. Maybe you've experienced failure or depression. Maybe your dreams have been blocked or you've been discouraged or you feel guilty. This can be God's discipline of us in our lives. And every time he disciplines us, it's because he's treating us like his sons and daughters. He loves us. Loves us enough to not leave us to our own devices. God chooses to get in our way, to stop us in our tracks, to gain our attention, to bring us to that place where we have godly sorrow. God loves you, and he wants to draw you back to a right relationship with him. And it's God's desire for each of us that we would understand his love and that we would experience his deliverance, his salvation, his forgiveness from our sinfulness through the saving work of Jesus. So in just a minute, as our benediction, we're going to have a song played that we can reflect on. So I'm going to call Kirsten and the worship team here. Come on up and get ready to share that with us. And when I step down, I'm going to just give us a time to reflect. You can reread the passage. You can ask the Lord, how's my heart? You can think through what the Word of God is speaking to you and allow the Holy Spirit to speak. But as we walk away from here, I want to encourage you to A, acknowledge God's existence. Acknowledge His existence. And B, believe God is able. So trust Him, and not yourself or not other people. And C, confess your sinfulness and your hardness of heart and live the life that God desires for you. So I invite you right now, take some moments through this song. When the song is over, we're dismissed. But enjoy this time of reflection and quiet with the Lord God who loves you.